Thank you. So, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, or just the pitch, a little loud. Um, so, the the topic of our discussion today is uh, nominally around organizational affiliation and what it is and why it's important and how chaos is going to be addressing this. Um, so, to kind of lead off to this uh, talk, I just want to kind of send out a general uh, PSA. Americans are weird. Um, and for those of you who are not Americans, it's probably the most redundant thing you've ever heard. So, but let me, let me give you an idea of why we're weird in this particular instance. I found this out at a social gathering um, at one of my daughter's schools. This was many years ago and the kids were really little and we were meeting all the parents. And one of the parents was from England. And I try to be social. My wife brings me out to social events and she's encouraged me to, you know, sort of engage with other people. I know that's a little weird for me, but whatever. Um, and so as a, as a person going up to a stranger at a, an event or a party like this, one of the leading questions is usually something around the lines, oh, so what do you do? Which what is your occupation? What is your career? What do you, how do you make money and, and, um, and go through life in a professional way? And I found out from this person whom I talked with, because she laughed at me, which is usually not the best opener for a conversation, um, that that was a very typically American thing to do, which I didn't really realize because I pretty much you know, did it all my life, so didn't really realize it was a thing that we do. But yeah, Americans are pretty much engaged in occupations. And in other countries, your conversational openers are probably not going to be initially around your job. It will be around things like, what do you like to do? Or where do you live? Or what, you know, what do your kids do? But anything but the occupation. So I found that really interesting and that sort of stuck with me. And I wanted to kind of bring that up as sort of an opener for this conversation um, and, and emphasize that this isn't going to be a talk necessarily about what companies our communities work for. Certainly that's a big part of it. But it is not the sole, um, sole piece of data that we're looking for. Um, and I'll expand on that during the talk. Plus, I always like to say that Americans are weird, because we are. Um, so why do we care about any of this, okay? What is it about organizational affiliation that keeps coming up over and over in a community conversation? Um, to give you an example, I work with the Red Hat Open Source Program Office, um, and we have been working and dipping our toes in metrics conversations for probably the last three to four years. Um, and I'm the person that sort of spearheads this within our team. And invariably what happens is every time I go around to our community um, managers and leads and say, okay, what's the one piece of data that you are most interested in? Because I really want to get that question answered for you. And these are true numbers, 88% of the time, because um, I measured it, um, it's always a conversation about, we want to know who's working for who and where people are coming from in our respective communities. That is the number one at Red Hat, the number one requested thing that people want to know. And I'll give you a little bit of background about this and why Red Hat is obsessed with this. We have, and, and those of you who've heard me speak before, I've mentioned this uh, periodically in other talks, we have a problem with organizational diversity at Red Hat because a lot of our projects are dominated by Red Hat employees. And on the, you know, on the first level, that sounds like a great thing for us because, you know, if we've dominated the open source upstream project, we pretty much can guide it wherever we want to go. But we have found historically that's actually not a good thing because two things will happen there. One, nobody will want to come in 
and be a part of our organization. There is a, they, there's a strong perception that if we are running a very Red Hat controlled project that outside developers are not welcome. That is not true, but it has a very hard perception to shake. And, and so we want to you know, encourage outside contributors to come in. And that leads to the second issue, which was we have found that our most successful projects historically have been projects that have really had a lot of diversity. Um, for example, when we are part of the larger OpenStack community, that is a wildly successful community. Um, and we are just one part of that. Um, we are part of, we are one small part of the, um, yeah, yeah, settle down back there. Uh, so we are also a big part of the wildly successful Kubernetes community. And we are just one small component of that. And we see a huge uh, amount of innovation there. We, and, and then to give you an example of something we do do right, um, I don't know um, how many people are familiar with Red Hat, but everything we do is in the upstream. Um, and one of our most successful projects, and one of the ones we care the most about, is called the Fedora Project. Fedora is an operating system that is the upstream for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And because of the way we work, that is probably one of our most important upstream projects. It is a seed from which e almost everything else we do um, expands and grows. Okay. What people don't re usually realize, and we just did a survey about this last spring, um, um, right now, currently, only 22% of active uh, Fedora contributors um, that, that we've been able to measure um, are working for Red Hat, um, which is great. Um, and, and we really loved, you know, when we heard that because it really reinforced the fact that, okay, in this community, we're doing it right. So that's why we care. And that's part of why, you know, you should care, but obviously everybody here is coming from different organizations and, and backgrounds. So I wanted to expand a little bit on the work that we've been doing around organization in Project Chaos. So I'm sort of going to take off the Red Hat hat now and put on the Project Chaos hat. And I've been a member of the Commons work group within Project Chaos um, for a couple of years now. And we, as, as Dawn mentioned earlier today, we just, a lot of the work groups just released formal metrics. Um, and I was a part of the team that put together the organizational affiliation metric, um, which was an interesting process in and of itself because that's the first time I've ever been personally involved in the release of anything, um, let alone a metric. So that was a, a, a really uh, educational experience. But let's talk about why it's important. One of the first things that we came to of, of why organizations as a rule um, should be kind of really uh, interested in this and why it's important to them is that measuring the footprint of an organization in a project or a larger ecosystem is important because we want to know about contributor diversity. And that is like, what's the ratio of a single company over all the, uh, all the contributor base? And by the way, I want to be very clear here. When I'm talking about contributors, I may slip up, I may say coders, I may say developers, I may say, because I'm old and I have habits and it creeps in. But just make sure that everybody understands I'm talking about contributors, whether they're documentation people, whether they're QA people, whether they're working on the project website, or they're doing, you know, they're doing code um, for the project itself. It's all part and parcel. So I should be saying contributors consistently. If I don't, I'm, you know, that's just a, a slip of the tongue on my part. I really am talking about all contributors here. Uh, we're not trying to differentiate types at this point. There are some questions that that will come up, um, but really, uh, as far as organizational affiliation goes, everybody's equal in this regard. Uh, okay, whether they're a volunteer, they're working for a company, they're working for a foundation, whatever they're doing and wherever they're coming from, all contributors, all cont contributions rather, are equal. Um, 
So we're trying to measure impact here because we want to see, you know, how are different organizations over time influencing a given project. Um, and then there's the other part of this, which this, um, this goes into um, an area that we have in chaos on the risk side of things. There are different work groups within chaos. Um, the risk work group is certainly one of them. And then the, this factor is, we, we call it the, the elephant factor. If we have more than 50% of you know, contributors that are coming from a single company, um, now the idea is it becomes the elephant in the room. Okay, and this leads back into our, our problem that we have at Red Hat, where we have projects with 70 to 80 percent of Red, of Red Hat, or the contributors are coming from Red Hat. Now we become, you know, the elephant in the room, and, and now we have a perceptual problem as far as, like, well, will people want to come in, and can we get people to uh, join us and, and assure to them that we are going to be good, good faith players in, in such an environment. Um, it's sort of a catch-22. The only way to fix it is to get other people to come in, but they won't come in because they think that we're going to not be good, good players in the, in the ecosystem. So it's, we're talking about, we're measuring impact, and we're also measuring influence. There are ways that organizational uh, organizations can influence an ecosystem without actually definitely be a, a contributor. Red Hat does this without thinking all the time. And I will tell you, when I used to work for the Linux Foundation a few years ago, um, I really didn't like Red Hat because they just basically, every time we did something, we had to seem like we had to confer with Red Hat. And uh, being the contrarian that I am, I was sort of like, why are we waiting for these bozos? Um, and, and making sure that we had to do things um, and that that they would approve of. And the reason why was because they were a big, they are, and, um, but at that time very much were, a very big player in the open, open source ecosystem. And, and I don't even know if Red Hat even really realized that was a thing. I don't think they ever took active advantage of that. I think they just basically, people seem to regard them. So you have influence as an organization, whether you know it or not, just by the cachet of being in a certain organization. Google, Amazon, um, um, Red Hat, SUSE, all these players in uh, Amazon, uh, I said that already, um, they, they all have influence in the open source space, whether they know it or not, just by virtue of being these companies and being active players in, in various open source projects. Other ways of influence, were, you know, um, is, you know, where did the code come from? And so who built the code first? We recognize that Kubernetes is started at Google. That was a Google project. So by virtue of that, a lot, socially we tend to give them a little bit more, you know, gravitas. You know, I have no idea right now where Google sits on the organizational contributor um, ranks within Kubernetes. I suspect they're number one, um, and that's great. But there may come a day when they're not number one, and that's totally fine, but I think people will still give them a lot of influence because they started it. They will, they will, give social, they will be given social deference, and you can't ignore that as a community because we can talk about numbers all we want, and we can play the numbers game and we can say, yeah, you know, so-and-so is number one in that community, but is that really important? Um, you know, because you can't ignore the social implications of, well, Google started this, you know, and, and they, by virtue of that, they should be given some, or, or will be given some social deference as well. So this is sort of the reasons why we were really looking at organizational affiliation as a metric. So I wanted to talk about, <coughs> about what actually we're seeking. I've given you sort of the, the, the sort of the whys of why we're involved with this question. And, and to some of you, this may seem obvious as, oh, well, we wonder why the sky is blue. So uh, you, th this is not 
rocket science as far as why we want to know this, but what are we actually seeking? And, and to, to do this, as, a, as in the Commons work group where this, this particular metric came from, we really had to break it down into bite-sized chunks of information. You can't just throw out a metric and say, okay, we want to know who's working where and everybody just go, okay? That, that's hard to implement. That's hard to implement from a tooling side and that's hard to understand from a conversational side. So, because here's the thing about metrics. There's never gonna be one metric that fits everybody's purpose because we're all coming from different places, we're coming from different motivations, different communities. We're gonna all be looking for different things. So the idea here and the, and the analogy that I keep throwing out in the work group meetings and I'm sure my teammates are probably sick of is we're thinking of these as Lego blocks, okay? We wanna get these, these metrics down to atomic pieces um, that can't really be broken down anymore. And then you all, as community leaders, should be able to pick and choose which metrics you want to answer a larger question. And so you're sticking together the Lego blocks and I'm making a little car or you're making a little rocket ship or you know, somebody's making a palm tree or something like that. It's the same Lego blocks, but by, you know, by virtue of being able to put them together in new and creative ways, you should be able to answer the exact questions that you need. So we broke these down <coughs> to smaller subsets of information um, and data gathering that we can get to the atomic level and, and therefore be able to express larger questions. Five minutes? Okay, so really quickly. Um, we've already talked about organizational affiliates um, and this is organizational influence, rather, and how dominant are the individual organizations in the project? Um, how, what's the elephant factor? So we've already gone over that. Relationships. We, it's not just knowing who's involved in a project, but how are these projects, you know, who's, what are the relationships between these companies? Are, you know, are these companies involved in a larger consortium or a larger fa software foundation? So software foundations now become a layer of information that we want to get. Um, how do we take care of dual organizational affiliations? Like, I happen to know that there's one company in the room that just got, got bought by another company. Um, and, and so now the questions are becoming, well, okay, so do we treat this blue company the same as the red company? Um, and do we treat them as separate or one? And trust me, these conversations are going on with us and software foundations, <coughs> Linux Foundation, all the time right now. And how do you, you treat that? Um, affiliation changes. People move companies all the time. You start at one company, you go to another company. And then which, you know, are certain companies becoming magnets for, um, you know, organizational affiliation. Is, you know, is Google hiring a lot of people? Is Amazon hiring a lot of people? Are people suddenly leaving a certain company? Uh, what's going on? So we look at magnets. We look at anti-magnets. If your company is suddenly losing a lot of people um, in your communities and as, as, as hires, um, either way, you've got a problem. Why are people leaving your company? Why are people, people coming in? So we look at things like that and look at affiliation changes and we've built metrics in to sort of take that into account. Um, contributing over time. Um, a lot of the, some of these metrics can be taken as a snapshot. Here's where we are now. But then when we look at these over time, now we can start to see, you know, trends and, and our, you know, and this gets into other metrics we have around evolution and growth and maturity and decline. Okay, so now we want to see, you know, how active are we? You know, Google is number one in Kubernetes. Well, are they going to continue to be number one? Are they slipping? Are they growing? What's that going to look like? Google might really want to know that. So we, we take these metrics and now we plot them over time and then you can get other questions answered. Um, how do we deal with people who are not 
um, affiliated with an organization, uh, people who are volunteered, uh, are volunteers coming into a project. That is a very important metric for us at Red Hat, especially when we're dealing with things like a lot of our projects are moving to an agile development model. Well, Agile is great, but if you have somebody who is a volunteer on the outside who is not necessarily going to have the time to devote to uh, a certain sprint over a given period of time, you inadvertently maybe lock them out. Um, so we, we want to look at who are our volunteers so we can identify them and figure out what their needs are within our larger community. Um, again, organizational diversity. We're talking about commits, we're talking about merges, we're talking about who are the contributors, um, the contributions they made, who's answering issues, who's creating issues. All of these are, sep are small little atomic measurements that we take into account within the organizational affiliation metric. Um, peripheral organizations, who are the people who are just coming in making these brilliant, awesome contributions, and then they're dropping, you never hear from them again. We call those drive-bys, okay? Drive-bys are usually, those are the people you really wanna come, we're like, wait, come back. You, you, you did something really brilliant and cool, but how do we get you back? Um, so first we have to figure out who those people are and then we can try to figure out, well, what's the pattern? What brought them, what brought them in to contribute in the first place? Leadership, <coughs> that's a big thing. It's not just contributors. How, how is the organizational affiliation in the leadership? If you have, a, um, I, I mentioned Fedora earlier, where we have 22% of the overall con contributors work for Red Hat, but that percentage is much higher at the leadership level. About, I think it's about 90% of the leadership functions within Fedora are Red Hat employees. So <coughs> now we have to say, okay, how diverse is Fedora if we not, if, people aren't percolating up. That is actually a problem we've identified and we're trying to correct that and get more non-Red Hat people in leadership positions. So you wanna take a look at that. That also leads into a diversity issue very quickly because uh, a diversity in terms of uh, DNI and next door, we wanna make sure that people of different backgrounds, races, genders, um, uh, orientations are also being included in leadership positions. Um, so that overflows very quickly with that as well. Um, fiscal considerations, who's paying for what? Um, how do these fiscal considerations uh, affect a project? If a certain organization is doing all the infrastructure work, that's fine, um, but then does that inadvertently block out other people? Um, or does it help get you know, onboarding made. If we don't have to worry about on uh, the infrastructure for a given pro open source project, that could be a good thing or it could per be perceived as a bad thing. Um, and how do those uh, contributions influence anything? Um, so that's certainly a metric that we look to gather. Um, ownership distribution, how is code ownership um, distributed across uh, the organization? Um, whether they belong to a certain company or not. Um, those are definitely considerations for projects like Kubernetes and OpenStack. Um, and, and how, you know, owning the code is still a thing. And, and sometimes that gets into foundational ownership, like who started it, and sometimes it's things around trademarks. Um, so the, we have metrics built in um, to the organizational affiliation uh, set that hopefully will take care of that. And, and look at that as well. And again, I'm just talking about the Lego blocks. Everybody here can sort of start putting them together. And this is just the start, okay? I've explained the, 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 the Lego blocks, the atomic metrics that we have, and I've rushed through them a little bit, and there's a whole good page of this on the chaos.community slash metrics website. Um, when we look at this, you know, we're, we're taking these atomic metrics and we're building bigger questions. So we're, big, we're looking at things like, what are the roles um, that, you know, when we add all these together, one of the questions that we can ask is, you know, what are the roles that people have with, from different um, organizations? How do we um, 
how do we not just look at the baseline contributions that an organization makes to a community, but what are, what are their leadership roles? You know, how, how do they get involved? Do they come in, I've seen this before, do they come in and they're on like a governing board, for instance, but then they never show up for the meetings? You know, well, that's, that's a thing. Um, and maybe we need to work to identify that because that can lead to stagnant growth or you know, no, no help at all. And we're, they're blocking other people who might have more to contribute from coming in. So I've, uh, I think basically you know, this is the outline of what we're trying to do. I, again, I want to refer you to chaos.community uh, slash metrics. Um, there is an excellent page of not just the organizational affiliation metric, but all of the new metrics that we've released. Um, I believe there'll be some other discussions about that um, today. But I encourage you to go out there and start looking. And because they're on GitHub, for the love of Pete, get out there and, and contribute and give us feedback. These are not static things. We want people to engage with all of these metrics and tell us what your ideas are and give us feedback on the ideas that we have. So with that, I thank you for your time. I've gone a little over, sorry, but um, let us get to the next people. Thanks, Brian. Maybe we'll ask some questions. Yeah, questions? Clearly. I don't, if I understand your question correctly around um, minimizing code ownership automatically within an organization, um, I'm not 100% sure that we can do that automatically. I think that has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Like an example of this problem would be um, we have, there are organizations that are not as transparent as others, and I'm not calling them out here because um, I'm being recorded, but they're not, they're not as transparent about what they do in the upstream versus what they do in the downstream. And, and that kind of gets into the whole code ownership thing. If you're putting in a lot of new feature sets in your downstream project that are not going into the upstream first, then that's, there's no automated way of fixing that. You really have to go in there and do a self-examination and start encouraging your developers to develop in the upstream as much as possible. And to be fair, Red Hat occasionally has a problem with this. Um, we are very open source minded, but it, there are some projects within our company that, have, it, that hasn't quite taken as well as others. And, and, and it's not even really something maliciously done, it's just like, We've got all this work we have to do on the downstream commercial project, our product, right? We want to do it all in there, and we have to kind of keep reminding people, no, you want to do it out in the open first, and then bring it down into the downstream. Um, so there's no real automated way, but identifying the problem is the first step to a solution, and that's what a lot of these metrics are. Uh, we haven't gotten into, we get into these discussions all the time about, well, how do we, uh, after we find this, how do we fix it? And we've had to step back and say, no, that's not our job right now. We're, we're, we're just trying to find the things that might go wrong um, or right, depending on the question or the metric being uh, presented. Um, how we solve these, um, that's a question for another time. But the, the, the TLDR would be, no, there's no automated way at this point. Okay. Oh, wait, one more? Maybe, do we? This, this actually may just end up being a discussion for later because you very, um, you very quickly glossed over the our most successful projects. What does success mean? How do you measure that the compass is successful? Because we talk about you know, diversity of contributors, is it successful because of district? Um, if I defined Fedora as our most successful project, I may have been in error. It is certainly, it is certainly our most important project. There, 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 
there's like maybe I can name two or three off right off the top of my bat that are the most important for Red Hat by virtue of what they are. I believe that Fedora is our most successful project personally because it has a wide range of diversity. We have competitors like Canonical and SUSE who are actively engaged in the Fedora project and we are actively engaged in their equivalents. So we, you know, that's for me, that's my personal brand of success. So you're right, it is a conversation for another time and I'm sorry I did gloss that over, but yeah, what's, but it's going to be different for me versus you or, or anybody else. So that, that is an excellent question. I'd love to follow up. And Matt's giving me the, the eyeball here. So, so. All right, thank you, Brian. Thank you.